Hello and welcome to the big World Cup match preview pod ahead of Ireland's final Pool B clash with Scotland on Saturday night in Paris. Permutations are as unpredictable as Finn Russell himself, but Ireland know that a win will set them up for a quarterfinal spot as pool winners. Joining me tonight, tonight are two Irish fans and Leinster fans. Firstly, making his seventh appearance, welcome back David Cordial. Thanks, Caelan. And a big welcome to our probably our first listener turned debutante in the form of Chrissy Hawkins. Welcome, Chrissy. Yeah, thanks for having me on. It's always good to have you. We'll get we'll get straight into it because no point dallying around. And we get start with the Irish 23, as we always do. Two changes there in the form of Ian Henderson and Dan Sheen returning for James Ryan and Ronnie Keller, respectively, with Peter O'Mahony, the war god himself, set to win his 100th cap. So the ma- match day squad reads as follows. A front row of Andrew Porter, Dan Sheehan, and Tyg Furlong. It's Tyg Byrne and Ian Henderson in the second row. The aforementioned Peter O'Mahony is at flanker alongside Josh van der Fleer and Caelan Doris completing the pack. The back line contains Jemsa Gibson Park and Captain Johnny Sexton. The imperious Bundiaki and Gary Ringos are in the centre with a back, lo- back line trio of James Lowe, Mac Hansen and Hugo Keenan. And finally, the bench reads... Ronan Kelher, Dave Kilcoyne, Finley Bealham. Uh, apologies, I have made a mistake. James Ryan and Jack Conan, not Ry Baird as my note says. Jack Conan, who is back into the match day squad. Connor Murray, Jack Crowley and Stuart McCluskey, the Ulster man, set to win his first World Cup appearance. David, I'll start with yourself. Strong looking Irish 15 with the two changes. All in all is kind of what we were expecting. Yeah, well, it's a, it's about as strong a team as we have. Uh, I think it's a it's a statement of intent from Andy Farrell and from Ireland that that the, from this point on in the World Cup it's it's knockout rugby. Uh, even though we're still technically in the pool stages, you know this is there are permutations through which Ireland can lose or draw this match and still go through. But I don't think that those would be acceptable to to Farrell or to the team. So I think this is a, this is a squad that says we're here to win and we're going to win every game we're in. Um, we're not leaving any chance. Uh, even with the 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 switching of Ian Anderson for James Ryan, uh, I think that doesn't diminish the team at all. Um, I think you know I've written down here that we have you know it's it's a really stable side. And I've talked to yourself about this in the past, and you've made the point that teams that end up winning the World Cups are the teams that can finish with as many of their first fifteen still intact by the end. And it seems like this is the settled Ireland fifteen. Yeah, if. Andy Farrell's uh, intent is to go all the way to the end, then if that's going to be reliant on keeping these 15 guys, as many of them, as fit as possible right to the very end. Um, it's, yeah, so uh, I've just written down that we've finally settled our centre pairing. Obviously, it's been coming for a few weeks with the the way he's been playing, but for uh, a little while there, it was uh, kind of open the air about who our 12 was, whether it was Bundy or whether it was uh, Robbie Henshaw with Bundy to come off the bench. I think that's fairly settled now. Bundy has just been hitting his stride at, at the exact right moment. And I think that that pairing between him and Gary and Rose in terms of, uh, in, in, you know, ferocious attack when they need to, and then pretty stout defense when it, when it's flipped around the other way, uh, prov- provides a lot of stability in the middle of the field. And then the back three from two players who it's easy to forget how relatively recent to test rugby, Mac Hansen and James Lowe are. They've just been, They've been imperious in that in that back row, and then held together by Hugo Keenan at, at fullback. So I think this this fifteen this this starting squad tells you that Ireland are in this to win it. And uh, if Scotland wanted to be shown respect, this is the most respect that could be shown because Ireland are not leaving anything up to chance. Yeah, absolutely. And as as much as you know, Roy Lawson, Tom English or whoever has been on Irish podcast this week, as much as they come out and say that Scotland respect Ireland and they're not getting ahead of themselves, there are comments in the past that that stray from that. But you look at that Irish team and there's there's going to be no chip in their shoulder about, you know, they don't respect us or they don't rate us because that is as locked and loaded as Ireland can go. With the exception, like even just saying Keen Healy or Robbie Henshaw come into that 23, like Dave Kilcoyne and Stuart Bertlowski, like if they were certain, I think we'd be okay. Do you know what I mean? Like that's the kind of situation we're in. Chrissy, mm-hmm. like we we want to talk about the bench because we have done in past podcasts. It's huge for Ireland. And just in, in how Ireland have managed to smother Scotland in previous games, you know, coming out 10 point victors when, 
you know, we have a prop playing a hooker and so on and so forth. What do you make of that that Irish bench? Yeah, like it's it's equally strong bench. I know you can kind of say you'd want Henshaw as a 23, but I think McCluskey will be there to do a job just as well. Um, I would prefer not to see Aki at 13, but, you know, he's been playing an absolute stormer for the last couple of weeks. So, like, maybe I shouldn't be worrying about it. Um, I one of the things I'm really happy to see is Jack Conan being back. Um, that's partially because he's one of my favorite players, but uh, you know, he's such a good solid player and he's very good, like for like replacement with Doris. Um, obviously Doris is a bit younger and fitter, but it's it's great to see see him coming back and getting his World Cup uh first appearance. But I think even if you could see how Scotland kind of fell apart as as soon as the bomb squad came on. Uh, last time now I'm like I think Balaam is is basically like for like uh Matrick uh for long at the moment. Uh Kelleher is fairly like fairly close to Sheehan, so like they're gonna make mass difference. Kilcoin is the only one I slightly worry about, but I don't think Scotland have really the backup on their bench to take on those three put together. You know, yeah. Um. Oh, so yeah, it's. Good to see it's a good bench, like and in... absolutely, and it's, and there's loads of experience there. And I think mm-hmm. you know, David, you weren't on for the South African preview, but we did touch on it in that one with um Keen, Jack, and and Reen. I think it was on that day. And you know, you when you have someone like Conor Murray coming off the bench, when you have someone like Dave Kilcoyne, James Ryan, James Ryan, who is rarely on the bench, a lot of people were looking up when was the last time. I, I know it happened against Samoa, but it is the exception rather than the rule. Like Jack Conan is, is a test line. I understand we, we make our jokes about test line doesn't mean everything, but like he's still a test line at the end of the day. Beelham has been there, done that and so on and so forth. And just, I know Chrissy is saying, you know, he's one of your favorite players. We are allowed to have provincialisms on this podcast. This is not one that forbids it. I do it the whole time myself. So I wouldn't it's be one to do to provincials. Have... It's to do with the number eight. <laughs> Ah, yeah, no, I get that, but I couldn't yeah. hold it back against anyone for for having favoritism. Mm. David, I I know you might be a Leinster fan, but you are a Peter Romani fan as well, and as it is one hundred cap, we have to talk about that. Like the the legend, the captain, the leadership, the just sheer bastardry about him. <laughs> you know, there's all that, but a huge honor, and I suppose like. We talked about for Keith Earl's 100 cap for Conor Murray's. These are the days that, that Ireland like to cherish as well. Yeah, very much so. I think we all know deep down that Stuart Hogg really retired because he couldn't bear to face O'Mahony one more time. But <laughs> <I yeah>, no. <laughs> <laughs> but no, Pete, Pete's just, I mean, you know, you look back, he's, he's you know, to be a, the, a test starter in this Ireland team, you have to be pretty good from the beginning, you know, just, just right at the gate. But it you know, the testament to Pete is how early he started. You know, he was Munster captain at, what was it, like 24 or something like that? Like something 20, like that, yeah. You know, which, he made yeah. his debut 12 years ago, so. And he was captain in 2016 or so. So, yeah, so like, from there. Bar- barely older than, like, Jack Crowley is now. It's 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 a, it's incredible how early, not only he was in teams, but, but leading them. And he's the kind of captain who leads from the front, I know. Uh, certainly the Lions tend to seem to fa- favour um, forwards as captains and I think he's the kind of example of why you want that he's the guy who's going to be in there he's at the front he's he is aggressive he's he's in your face I don't know how how you know his his uh, dealings with refs are but he's 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 the kind of player that you will follow into into fire he's the kind of guy you would run into a wall for and that's not to mention his own personal skill set you know you have that guy in your line out you're probably not going to lose many and you might even steal a few and then you know at the breakdown, he is just an absolute menace to the opposition, which is exactly what you want from your number six. So it's look, it's 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 a hell of a thing to ever hit hundred caps, but I don't think it comes as a surprise to anyone that Peter Armani has done that, because at provincial level, at Test level, or at at you know British and Irish Lions level, he is a standout in in every team he's in, and I think it's the the respect he's shown not just by Irish and Munster fans, but by fans from other countries as well who even you know even are you know we have friends in in south africa who've who've mentioned how 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 much they've uh, admired him and for how long so i think all of that is a testament to the man and and why it's not really a surprise that he's hit 100 caps 
Absolutely. And then as well as that, I'll move on for Peter O'Mahony in a minute. Um, but Chris, he like his career, it seemed to slow down and it, it goes through these patches. It slows down, it picks up. And, you know, around 2020, when CJ Stander was there, Doris was coming through, people were saying, will O'Mahony drop out? And now you look at him this year in particular, and I know I'm saying this is a monster fan and haven't seen him playing every game he's played this year. Well, he seems to have gone to another level as well. And I, I would not be surprised. I don't know if you feel the same that we're probably due a big Peter O'Mahony performance in one of these World Cup games. Yeah, um, I totally agree with what you're saying. There has been like times where he's slowed down or someone's come through, but I feel like every time that's happened to him or he's been put on the bench to drop out of the starting 15, he's given them a reason to put him back in. And now, like at the moment, there is no doubt like that he should be on that starting team. Um, he's just a monster and he's always ready for a fight, which is always great to see. Like, you know, someone someone irritates him, the two people you'll see running up are him and Porter. <laughs> um, but yeah, like he's he's an absolute like amazing player. I think he fully deserves to be where he is. And yeah, I think I think he'll save it probably for like the quarters, maybe. You know, he, I, yeah, he's definitely... Or, or a final, if we monster. get that right. Yeah, yeah, like, you know, but I mean, like, he, he could have two in the World Cup. He's in that kind of, like, you know, he just looks angry at everything. <laughs> and, you know, you know, when he looks like that, it's going to be a good game. Yeah, I, I made this a similar comment about um Bundiaki that the evening was it the Tonga game. I think I said that to you, David. I think it was the Tonga game where I felt like he was either going to get man the match or get sent off because he looked so incredibly <laughs> pumped up for it. He got yeah. man the match. He was unbelievable. And that kind of, Peter Mahoney has that about him as well, where you just know when he's on it. And if we see that in his eyes on Saturday evening, then you know he's on it as well. And funnily enough, listening to Dan Levy on the RT Rugby podcast this week, he said that I think the entire O'Mahony clan is, is heading over for this one. They were waiting for his 100 caps, so... That's always good as well, because we've said before with Andy Farrell, he, he likes to get family involved in these things. And I think that helps that happier camp. And, you know, but we'll move on to Scotland now. And <laughs> maybe it's a bad segue because they haven't always had a happy camp. But listen, there's no one here to dispute me on that. We draw Scottish guests this evening. They have a very similar look inside than what lost to South Africa in round one. But notably, Blair Kinghorn, the fullback, will make his 50th appearance for Scotland, which is really hard to believe. It feels like he's only just burst onto the scene recently. So I'll start with, with their lineup. Um, Pierre Schumann starts at loose head with George Turner and Xander Fagerson in the front row. Richie Gray and Grant Gilchrist are, are restored in the second row. While Jamie Ritchie captains the side for Blydeside, alongside Rory Darge of Glasgow and Jack Dempsey, also of Glasgow. The back line contains the returning Ali Price, who partners Finn Russell, the mercurial Finn Russell at halfback. The Tui Pilato Hugh Jones centre partnership is restored as well. And a back three of Duhan van der Merva, Darcy Graham, and the aforementioned Blair Kinghorn. And that finally leads to a ferocious bench, which features Ewan Ashman, former Ulster prop Rory Sutherland, Willem Nell, Scott Cummings, Matt Fagerson, Luke Crosby, George Horn, and Ollie Smith. And for those who may not be well read up on Scottish rugby Crosby an Edinburgh flanker who doesn't get many games ahead of Hamish Watson gets the nod ahead of him this week in the 6-2 split so that's definitely worth keeping an eye on Chrissy I'll start with yourself Scotland we kind of could have predicted this this starting team from the offset what's your thoughts on it yeah absolutely like you know it's it's almost like the Irish team you kind of know who's going to be picked isn't it um yeah they've they're obviously going with their best team because they know they're going to have to put that out to have any chance of progressing I think like especially Kinghorn like you have to watch him he's majorly talented Um, and then obviously we have the question of which Finn Russell shows up which is uh, hopefully the one that usually shows up against Ireland which is about a six or six and a half out of ten style performance yeah <laughs> It's that thing, like he's the architect of everything good and bad on that team all at once. Um, looking at the likes of the like the the front row, they did give South Africa a good test at the start. They were really like they were getting under Malherb and some of the scrums. So kind of will have to watch those guys, I think. But um I think we can take them anyway. 
well, we all we're all open that like yeah. there be, there's not much doom and gloom in this podcast, especially when David is with us in particular. <laughs> but David, I'll get your thoughts on it now because like a lot of talk in recent times, I wrote about this in the preview article, which goes live on Friday, depending on when you listen to this, is that so often when we talk about Scott well, I've talked about Ireland in years gone by, it was how do Ireland win? Now that narrative has changed. It's now about how do you beat Ireland? But I want to go back, <laughs> coincidentally. And I just want to see, from your point of view, where do you think Ireland can exploit Scotland? And I might get, and I even have my own thoughts on this, so I hope you don't bring up the same part. But where do you <laughs> think we can exploit them? Well, I think the, the really great strength of this Ireland side, and I think it came through in the in the South Africa game when, when we went with a 5-3 split, when there were a lot of calls to, to go 6-2, is that Ireland are determined to play their own game. And you can either play it with them or or they'll run over the top of you. They they don't really broker the opposition's opinion on matters as much. They're very happy to dictate how they want to play. So I think we can expect the same kind of um the same kind of moves from Ireland as we've seen up till now. I think the the places they can expose Scotland are that, you know, it took an incredible defensive effort from New, from uh, South Africa, rather, uh, and Jesse Creel in particular to keep Ireland out. Scotland do not have that level of defensive nerves. They're not they're they are a good team, but they are primarily an attacking team. I don't think they have the the defensive chops to keep to keep Ireland out. I think the center pairing they've picked is interested is interesting. They have Hugh Jones and uh, Sione Tupulato in there. Very good players, but primarily attacking players. They haven't picked Chris Harris. He would be a stronger defensive 13. So I think Ireland can exploit that. I think on the edge, he's a big man and he's he likes scoring tries, but Duhan van der Merwe's edge defense is poor. I watched back the uh, the highlight reel from the Ireland Scotland game in Murrayfield early, earlier this year, and Jack Cron- Jack Conan gets crossed from a try. It's very good. Uh, it's a very good score from Conan, and he he, he has it's the muscle a great as well. Pass from Hansen as well, but he he doesn't present the it, right picture, does he? It is, but it, it's 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 you know Scotland have the numbers on the outside there. Johan van der bites in on Keenan uh, long before the ball. Uh, the, ball flies across the front of him. And when Keenan was already covered by another inside man and, and Conan, yes, Van der Merwe gets to him, but Conan's momentum and his own strength means he never really has a hope of stopping him. And Conan ends up grinding the ball well within the field of play. So I, I think that that edge defense from Van der Merwe is something that Ireland can also target. Um, when it comes to shutting Scotland down, obviously Finn Russell is the linchpin. He's, he's the player who most of the play will go through. I think the trick with Russell, you said, I won't, I won't say what you said to me because you might want to say it yourself, but I, I think the way that we can expose that is that no matter what you do to Finn Russell, he's never going to stop playing like Finn Russell. So if you want to take advantage of that, start going after where you know he's going to he's going to throw loose passes, he's going to throw this, that, and the other. I think someone asked, I was at an event the other night, and someone asked, what are the chances of Matt Hansen getting an, an intercept try? And I think there's a decent chance because if you put them under a lot of pressure, they're going to start flinging wild passes. They're going to keep trying to play that um, that sort of frenetic form of attacking rugby that they do. And we can we can pick them off from that. And then the final thing is that as strong as their bench is, ours is a lot better. So I think we flood the the pitch. We could, we could even go, if the scoreline suits us, we could even go and uh, the full bench, including the replacement out half, I don't think the our attack would drop at all if we br- brought Jack Curley on. Uh, certainly, bringing Conor Murray on for Jameson Gibson Park isn't a step down either. And those fresh bodies, eight fresh bodies coming off the the bench, Scotland can't match that. And um, so that's 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 where I think we'll we'll take them apart. Absolutely, and I I agree with all those points. And I was going to talk about not necessarily Finn because I feel like. In Irish rugby circles, we kind of underrate Finn a small, but he's still a fabulous player. But it's more their centers. I just don't, I don't buy the two Pilato Jones thing. They're they're good players. Don't get me wrong, but like, do you remember anything Tui Pilato did against Ireland from that game? Apart from a big f off celebration after the Hugh Jones try, he did nothing after that. Do you know what I mean? Like he was going laterally. They Scotland had something like zero clean line breaks in the last hour of that game or something in Murrayfield they've their penetrative running is very very poor it's very wide wide it's easy to shut down Fekitoa did a great job against the two of them for Munster in that URC quarterfinal as well and like am I taking Fekitoa over ring rows no that's a step up do you know what I mean like that's kind of what we're talking about here and even just the fact that like we have 
on the bench. If Johnny Sexton goes down, we have Jack Crowley. Been there, done that, bought the T-shirt. You know, we we know what to expect from this guy. They have Blair Kinghorn, who plays most of his games at, at, at fullback. Plays very well at fullback. Plays most of his games at fullback. But, like, surely having two Maverick 10s is a recipe for disaster as well. It's like, no matter how good they are, and Finn is a wonderful, wonderful player. Like, I don't understand how Ben Healy or Adam Hastings can't even get a look in in this squad. Chrissy, I'll turn it over to you now. Like, I know David and myself have probably gone through most of the team there, and I apologize that we didn't leave much opening, but where would you think Ireland can exploit them, or is there anything you'd like to double down on? Even? Yeah, I'd agree with, like, I suppose, um, it was when you always said that about Tim T- I actually don't remember him in that game. And I also, from that game, I remember being like, is Duhan van der Merwe still playing? Because he was also absent in that game. Um, the missed tackles helped from yeah. <laughs> to see him. <laughs> well, like, you know, he may as well have not been there if he's missing them. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, so I do I do agree. I think it's interesting they've decided to go Ali Price first. That's, um, he's yeah, kind yeah, of it's, been... It's a change of formula. They usually go with Ben White and mm-hmm. he's just been dropped out of the 23 altogether, which I, I don't really understand. Yeah. Gregor Townsend makes some interesting choices sometimes, doesn't he? He really does. It it wouldn't be in my nature to. I'm not a big fan of Townsend, um, as it is. But this one, I don't really get. David, I know you're well read on these things. Do you know? Have you any idea why they went with Price over, over Ben White? Not really. I mean, Price Price did have like a kind of a um, almost a cult following in certain parts of. Scotland and in, in the rest of the UK. Uh, he is a very good scrum half. I was interested to note that he's, he scored a try against Romania and it was the first time he'd scored since before the last World Cup for Scotland, which is... Did he not score? Uh, oh, yeah, no, I think yeah. George Horne scored a few tries there last World yeah, Cup. Yeah, the, the last time he scored was in the warm-ups for the 2019 World Cup, so a bit of a dry period for him. Uh, I don't know why, though, that they've... That, that, that sudden shift to, to him from Ben White, who seemed to be a little more nailed on, it was... An odd one, but I I think even that combined with the six two split, there is an as there is an element of yes, while they are fielding most of their their best players, there there is an element of throwing stuff to the wall and see what sticks yeah. from this to a degree. So I don't know, and like to to double down on what, on what Chrissy said about Tui Pilato and and Van der Merwe and, and not being one hundred percent sure if they were on the field. The thing I really got from the Romania match, and it was kind of funny to watch how over the moon they were with how well they played. I was like, okay, that's I mean, you know. Okay. Yourself, mentality and all that yeah but it was that scotland look really good in attack and to be fair to them they're a good attacking team they're one of the better attacking teams that's were you know, they that... good in attack the last era or romania just poor like they both See, that's thing, opportunities. It, it, it is hard to know and like when you look at back half of it's just darcy graham finding space and outpacing people who he's He's fitter and faster than that's it. He won't get... turn turn slower than Freddie Stewart. One, my dad. Yeah, he he won't get those opportunities against Ireland. So I think the the Jones uh, two Pilato axis is one of attack. Duan van der Merwe is an attacking winger, which seems a kind of a tautology to say. But like you know, compare him to our number eleven, James Lowe, who who can attack but has turned defense into such a strength. I think the reason you don't see Duan van der Merwe, you don't see. See only two Pilato when it's a 22 7 scoreline to Ireland is because when they're not attacking, those players are, are kind of anonymous, smothered, mm. yeah, essentially, yeah, 100%. And like that is the thing about Scotland, you don't know what to expect, you do know what to expect, but you also don't, do you know, like that's kind of an element of them. Like, I look at like Chrissy made the point, like about Townsend, like you don't really know what he's thinking, like, surely considering Ireland scored two tries directly from winning box kicks and winning Gary Owens in that game in Murrayfield. He still didn't bring back in Kyle Stain, who was a fullback turned winger, who's better in the air than Graham or Van der Merva. They have Ollie Smith on the bench, who's supposed to cover 13. And Glasgow fans aren't convinced of him as a 13, from what I'm aware of. You know, they have Blair Kinghorn as their backup 10. Some people are convinced of him as a backup 10, but external view is, is they're not. There's so many question marks there. It's only when you dig into it, really, that you can see it. Or now maybe that's just me being a bit harsh and the week of all weeks, but I just feel like there's a lot more question marks there 
And even yeah. their line out has, has been a big one as well. Chrissy, go on, you can jump yeah, in. Yeah, so the fact they've gone for the 6 2 split, that wouldn't really interest me because you don't really associate them with a team that goes for a 6 2 split. So that to me looks like they're going to try and like fight with us, basically. You know what I mean? They're going to try and bully us. They know that we just go through their forwards. So they want a few extra, but I don't think that's going to make a difference. I think they'd be better off having the extra back like that. Like Kinghorn is a fantastic fullback and he's played better since he's been actually able to play in fullback as opposed to being shoehorned into 10 because they needed to keep the space open for Hog. So if anything, it's going to make things more difficult for them should they have to take Russell off. Yeah, absolutely. And like the idea of going 6-2 against Ireland because you feel like you can get more parity there but not doing against South Africa even is a weird one in and of itself, isn't it? Because you'd imagine you do it for, against the team who are the team of 6-2. Do you yeah. know, like maybe that's just me, but David, do you want to jump in before we finish the, the Scotland bashing? <laughs> yeah, I wanted to jump in and be really unpopular and defend them. Uh, in, in an aspect, <laughs> is like I think there is an aspect of you know, there was a lot of talk of which is the pool of death. This was the pool of death to have the three of the top five rank, ranked teams in the world in the one pool, it's insane. And um, Scotland knew that they were always going to have a hard a hard job for this. Like to have to face the world champions and the world number one, it was always going to be a long shot. I think Gregor Townsend, you know, there was a point not too long ago where his job wasn't certain anymore. So there is an element of a free hit to this. I'm sure they'd love to qualify. It, it is kind of galling for a team that should be probably a little bit better than they are to not qualify for the quarterfinals twice in a row. But the odds were stacked against them from the beginning. I do think that that's, you know, as Christy said about them going for the six-two split is an odd thing. I think that is the, that is a mistake on their part in the in the way that Ireland win five three against the box rather than be lured into trying to go six two and fighting them in their game. Scotland should have stuck to their guns and, and said, No, we're a five three team. We're gonna focus on what makes us good and not try to neutralize what makes Ireland good because they don't have the pack to do that. Um and I that being said, when it comes to a fight in 10 minutes, I would not be surprised if there is an actual fight in the first 10 to 15 minutes. Because when the chips are down and things aren't going the way, I can I can definitely see uh, harsh words being exchanged between like some, some, some Scotland players and, and possibly the man getting 100 gas. <laughs> Glasgow, that's... <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Um, where, where did that come out of? For those who aren't watching us on YouTube and are just tuning in on, po- on podcast form, David's Zoom background is Hugo Keenan's tackle on short hog. So let's not act like he's a Scotland fan either. Like, you know, he's just he's just being partial, and I respect that. Excellent, excellent bit of defensive play. Excellent, yeah. But he also made a hames of it as well. It's funny, you made a point there about that kind of wildness, and it's it's almost ironic too. Like everyone said, oh, Finn, when he was in now the team, was because he was too wild, he was making too many mistakes. Jeez, you could say the same thing about Townsend selections of late, couldn't you? Do you know like that's that's the irony too. And we'll we'll move on. We'll move back to kind of Ireland now and and all that. And I'll, I, I'll go on. Just one one last point. It's just uh just to to double down on the the thing we said about Darcy like I said about Darcy Graham and the, the tries he scored against Romania. They're really suited to when you're better than the team you're playing against. They yeah. don't do as well when you're not. And I think the the real example of that is that in the South Africa game, they had really one opportunity to score a try. They broke, they finally got through South Africa's defense. Very difficult to do, particularly when you got Jesse Creel at 13. They get, they get, they start to get up the left wing. Darcy Graham is the man in possession and he doesn't give the pass. Yeah. He tries to run it himself. And when the defensive team are strong enough to stop you, you don't get the try. If he'd given the pass there, maybe Scotland get a try and maybe the, the dynamics of that game change. But when they're relying on just being individually better than the opposition, then when that falls apart, then they, they don't have anything to fall back on. And not only not getting the try, but you concede the ball, you, you end up getting turned over. And that's kind of what happened to Ireland in the first half of that game as well, was when we didn't score, we got turned over and we were going back 50 metres and it becomes a game within a game in and of itself. Do you know, that's... The, the ebb and flow to use a Jerry Thornism. We will get on to predictions. So, and I'll start with yourself, David. So, before you tell us who do you think will win, I want you to just bring us through where do you see the game being won and lost, first of all, and then who do you see winning that? I think the game will be won uh, in, in two. Uh, it'll be won up front. It'll be won by the pack. Ireland have one of the, the best packs in the world. It is not a scrummaging pack. It is it perhaps not the heaviest weight pack in the world, but they're fast, they're mobile, 
they're at the in, at the defensive breakdown. They're niggly. They're combative. We have breakdown threats all over the place. And I think that's just going to, it's going to deprive Scotland of possession. It's going to deprive them of quick rook ball. It's going to really frustrate them and, and force errors out of them. And then beyond that, we're going to, we're going to fall back on what, when Ireland are in possession, what's going to win it for them is their face play. Ireland have incredible face play attack. They managed to get through South Africa, who are probably the, one of the best defensive teams in the world a couple of times um, and only to be stopped by incredible scramble defense. Scotland don't have, incredible scramble defense so it's going to be the forwards are going to are going to frustrate the hell out of them and then when they can get the ball back to the backs the backs are going to cut them open um yeah fair enough and so you're saying ireland have you emerging for us sir uh, i think it's going to be ireland by by 20 oh that's bigger than i would than i'd be going with chrissy um I, the, the tone of this conversation makes me think we're we're all going to pick the same team to win here so might as well just say that but again who do you see win this and where do you see it being won and lost oh, poor Scotland this is a Scotland bashing podcast it really is. isn't it so much for balance I have a feeling Finn's going to have a bad day and it's going to happen when like as uh, as like David said there they're going to frustrate them. He's going to get frustrated. He's going to do something stupid. He's going to start trying to be too cool. Like they tried to play around South Africa that didn't work and they never changed that tactic and they don't do that. So they're going to get more wound up with us. I think that's going to really uh, be issue and like their defense, we're going to go through their defense. Like if you see our two wingers are like jumping over, getting events, getting the jackals as good as any back rower. So if their guys can't even make tackles, it's not going to go well for them. So I I actually, I've had people asking me all week, like, what do you think of the game? It's like, I'm not nervous. I haven't been nervous about this game. Um, Scotland have given me nothing to be nervous about. And the game against, like, they weren't great in the warm-ups. They didn't play to the second half, but three games. And South Africa just, they only played one half in that game too, but it was the first half. So um yeah it's gonna be gonna be Ireland. I I I agree with your summation entirely there actually because, like, okay maybe as the game sets in you do you know the nerves start to kick in that's normal you know as fans, but like we we don't deny that we're not we're not all fans at the end of the day but I have said before I'll be afraid of Scotland when they prove they can beat us, mm. and in the preview article that I wrote that goes up to my, goes up Friday. I do talk about that mental block. Like if Scotland don't get off to a fast start, how do they convince themselves in the heat of the moment that this isn't the same old story? Because it's it's so hard. And it's it's not a slate on them, but it is so hard to get over that line without the stars aligning against a bogey team like what Ireland are. And I I expect Ireland, I don't know how true it is. There was rumors of Johnny Sexton picking up an injury. If that's the case, they're going to want him to come off early. That's the case. I can see Johnny just having one of those days and he just runs them ragged and we have this game won. I think if we go off to a fast start, we'll have a one by the hour mark personally. And that's when we'll start to see change. And yeah, maybe Scotland might claw it back a small bit, but they're not that type of team either. Not against not against Ireland, not against Ireland's defense, which I think David, you touched upon. Our defense has been phenomenal. I watched back the highlights myself of that game and I couldn't get over the intensity of which we defended. It was like as if, and I know people tell me it's it's a faux rivalry, but it is kind of like those Munster Glasgow games. There's always a bit of niggle between Ireland and Scotland. There is a rivalry there, and it is enjoyable. I I I go Ireland. I think they'll win by about ten. Um, personally, maybe ten to fifteen. That's just kind of what everyone's going with, to be honest. Just before we leave it, I just have one last thing because we're all we're all saying we think Ireland will win. Just on the pool stage at large, just a brief comment. I'll go to yourself first, Chrissy. Like, if Ireland do come out of this unscathed as well as with the win, because we don't want injuries either, is is the reality of it. What have you made of Ireland's pool stages so far? I think they've they've been really really good. You know, they got obviously Romania. You can't really use that as a thing, but even the Tonga game, Tonga came out firing and they were patient and they waited and they didn't score for the first twenty minutes, which is very unlike Ireland. But there was no fluster in the team. The team were just playing the phase until they got there. South Africa was just more. 
And uh, in fact, we came off the end of that. Like, uh, I don't know how either team didn't come out with injuries off the back of that game. Like, it was just so intense and so physical. And I think that really set the tone for us and made a statement for every other team in the World Cup as well. So I think so far, and that's another reason why, like, coming into Scotland game, I'm like, look, we got through that. This just shouldn't be too bad. So I think, yeah, and I think the group stages have been as good as they could have been, to be honest. Absolutely. Uh, David, you'll probably be on with us again at some stage um, in the knockouts, but just your own thoughts on, on Ireland's pool stage and, you know, the, the kind of the wave of momentum as it's going, because it feels like, and maybe I'm reading too much into it, but it feels like this is different. This World Cup, you know, like 2019 felt like the same old story. 2015 felt like the same. this feels different. The pubs are different. The clubs are different. The the fan experience. I know you were over in was it Nantes and like it was rocking. Stade France was rocking with a song that we're probably not allowed to mention. <laughs> if you know, depending on who listens, it it feels different. And it, are you confident that should Arda get over the line, that that wave of momentum keeps going? Yeah, I think so. And I th- I think. Going on to piggyback on something Chrissy said, they're they're you know about Ireland not scoring right away, uh, but but not not panicking. There's a calmness to this team, like they they are in the moment calm. as as ferocious as they need to be. But there is a an incredible calmness, almost a stillness to them. You know, I think the best example of that is probably if you go back to the New Zealand tour in 2022, after they won the Test in Dunedin. There were celebrations, obviously. You won a test, and it's the first test we ever won on New Zealand soil. But you could see they went, good, great. Let's go and do it again next week. Like straight away. Their their mental space. I I think it's I think it's Gary Keegan is the man they've got in there um working on the the head stuff. He I whatever he's being paid, it's not enough because their mental preparedness for this is just unbelievable. They seem completely unfazed no matter what the situation. They are not overawed by success. They are not um overblown by any any setbacks. They they're they're just it's they just have this mental strength to them that really seems to stand. So I think that's going to carry them as much as the support. And I think it was Murray Kinsler said after the matches, they're the Irish team are going around the stadiums. It's not a lap of honor. It's a lap of gratitude. It's them saying thank you because we are the Irish people are turning it in tens of thousands. We had friends there who were there in Stade, uh, the Stade de France when we played South Africa. The official numbers were 30,000. She reckons it was probably closer to 45. You know, I think they have this wave of support behind them, but they have the mental clarity to be able to not be overawed by no matter what situation they find themselves in. And I think the structure of the pools actually ended up suiting them perfectly because it meant we could ease ourselves in with Romania, then into Tonga, get probably the toughest match of the pool out of the way in, in South Africa and get the win there. And then not dip in intensity against a, a very good Scottish side to finish. And like from here on out, it's it's knockouts and, and that's tough. But if you look at it another way, we got we got a rest week in, we've got Scotland next week. If we do our jobs right, if we play right, there's three matches after that. It's four intense weeks of very tough matches. And I think this Ireland team, more so than any that's gone before it, has the the mental and the physical resilience to get through those four weeks. I completely agree. And one of the reasons I passed over to you, not because you're optimistic, but because I, I felt from talking to you, you had the same sense of me, like Ireland, this does not feel like a team who beats themselves like past, like past teams. would. it doesn't feel like a team that wilts under any circumstance. If he's like, how do you beat Ireland? You have to be better than them for 80 minutes. That's like, it's just the way it's been over the last two years. Like it's, They've won twenty eight out of the last thirty tests or something crazy like that. Yeah. And they and they have and they haven't been, and they haven't been walkovers. You know, like no, we beat South Africa. They've done it every way. Every but like you know, way. they they had an attacking ball in our line in the final minute, and the lads just held the line and and got the win. You know, it, the, if you look back at the matches against New Zealand, yes, we won, but they weren't. We didn't blow them out of the water. These lads just have what it takes to 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 dig their heels in and go. No, we know what we're doing. We're going to follow our plan. We're going to stick to. We're going to trust each other. We're going to trust ourselves, and we're going to get it done. And I think that's the thing. They trust each other. I think we trust this team. We trust that they will deliver, that they won't just go back into their shells. Like I, as I, I maybe this this chat, which is good, has kind of restored my confidence in this team again. Not that it dropped severely, but 
I said before the tournament of Ireland beat South Africa, I feel like we make a final. I'm going to stick with that. I think this is just different. You can you can sense it. You know, there's something about this run. Like there was even something about how Munster ended the season last year that just felt different. Or whenever Leinster go on and win Heineken Cups in years gone by, you almost knew from a couple of games out. And that's what rugby is like. You can sense these moments coming. I do feel like Ireland will get the job done. I don't think they'll have it all their own way this week. I don't think they'll have it all their own way against probably New Zealand in a quarterfinal. But I feel like they'll get the job done. They'll get over the line. They'll keep moving. And I think this is just one part of it. But they do have to win. <laughs> First and foremost, they could draw, but nobody's time for that. It was too stressful last time out. I'm sorry. Like I, I was convinced Ty Byrne had that ball. I was just not convinced that Ben O'Keefe for I can't remember who, which referee it was I think it was Ben O'Keefe yeah, was actually going to yeah. give the scrum to us <laughs> like that's, that's I, we don't need that we don't need that for our emotions but personally our, I, my emotions are, are quite in check at the moment for now and thank you very much for coming on for the chat and it has helped it's helped me I hope it helps people at home because I've been told a few times these podcasts have, have raised the stress levels of the listener <laughs> <laughs> but as always, thanks very much, lads, or lads and ladies, for for coming on tonight, and for everyone at home for listening. I will be back on Sunday with a recap of this pod, aiming to have it out towards the afternoon, you know, bef- before the Fiji door, Fiji Portugal, isn't it, David? Fiji Portugal. Yeah. It is Fiji yeah. Portugal. Yeah, yeah. Um, before that, the only real big game on Sunday, to be honest. And the round review podcast will come on Monday. We'll have to take a look back on all four pools and how they've unfolded. As always, if you do like what you see or hear, please do subscribe and tell a friend. It makes all the difference for myself and for everyone. It's greatly appreciated. And as well as that, coming very soon, there will be a bit of news on the season ahead on this podcast and, and further afield. I'll leave it at that. Again, thanks for my guests for coming on. You can find their socials down below. You can find my socials down below. But for now, until next time, if you're heading to Paris, enjoy it. If you're staying at home, hopefully we can all enjoy it as well. Everyone at home, take it easy.